Well, I get to do the funnest part, and that is to introduce our speakers. Every year, it's just such a joy to uh, get some different men up here, and we enjoyed uh, Dr. Ardervanis last night, and we'll uh, hear from him again uh, this afternoon uh, in, in, the, in our last session. But it's my joy to introduce uh, a young man that many of you probably have never heard of, but what you don't know is that he has uh, stood in John MacArthur's pulpit a number of times and uh, is uh, probably somebody who's going to impact the kingdom in decades to come in ways that we have uh, yet to see, and I'm eager to see that. But our speaker grew up in Northern Ireland, and I've always said that even if he was a lousy preacher, he's so much fun to listen to <laughs> just for that reason. But he trained as an elementary school teacher, and while he was uh, working as a teacher, he became involved in youth ministry and in lay preaching. His, his father has been a pastor for many, many years. And so in 2010, he moved to California to attend the Master Seminary, where he's now received uh, several degrees, including his Doctor of Ministry. Uh, while he was at Grace Community Church, he served in the Crossroads Ministry. He was also the pastor over the junior high ministry there. And in 2015, Andrew moved back to Northern Ireland, where he now serves as the senior pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Lisburn. He also assists Dr. Steve Lawson in running the uh, Doctor of Ministry program at the Master's Seminary. He and his wife, Sarah, have one daughter, one son, and they're expecting a third child. Uh, he's a close friend of our music minister, Darren Weeb, and so uh, Darren was instrumental in getting him here. So if you don't like him, it's Darren's fault. <laughs> if you love him, it was my idea. <laughs> You're going to love Andrew. I think two words come to my mind when I think about him. The first one is thoughtful. He never does anything without thinking it through. He's thoughtful in his conversation. He's thoughtful in his ministry. And he is such a blessing to his church because the second word I would use to characterize him is pastoral. He has a tenderness. He has a love for God's people. And it comes out in his preaching. It comes out in his conversation. So would you join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Andrew Curry. Good morning. It is nice to come somewhere where everybody has a funny accent. It's good. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. We've been in our church in Ireland talking about these Reformation doctrines. Next week, I fly to Romania to talk to uh, a conference of pastors about these same doctrines. And now we also get to be in Central California to talk about the same doctrines. I think that's descriptive of why these doctrines are important. They reach all around the world, and people all around the world this month are talking about these same core principles. Why? Well, because they changed the world. It wasn't a, a, re, uh, it wasn't a discovery of something brand new. I think we've got to remember that when we think of the Reformation. Rather, what happened in the, sixth, the 16th century was a rediscovery of something that the church had always, the true church had always been built upon. And Jesus said that this message would uh, reach every tribe, kindred, and tongue. And it's very exciting, isn't it? That we are in a generation where every uh, country, certainly in the world, is in some way talking about these same principles. What a wonderful thing that our world has been, and there's more to be done, but our world has been reached with the gospel at some level. It should give us excitement this morning that we come and we get to talk about something, faith alone primarily. We get to talk about this doctrine that really is, in this very moment, changing our world. It's exciting, and it's changing our world not simply because it's good theology, but it's because it's theology that the sinful man needs. If it's going to have union with Christ, knowledge of the Father and the Holy Spirit, our helper making us move through this life. Let's take just a moment, because you've hard work to do now. You've got to listen to this weird, quirky accent. If I see really confused expressions, there's a few people here I know, and we'll get them up to do live translation, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, you can at least politely smile at me, and it won't, won't necessarily come to that. But let's pray and ask, even more importantly, for God's help. Let's pray. 
Our Father, we do thank you that your word reveals to us who we are. And we thank you, Lord, that though it reveals such an ugly picture, that we were dead in our sins and transgression, yet we thank you for the revelation of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are talking about the, the, the soul as that it was him alone, that it was grace alone, that it's faith and looking to Christ alone for the glory of God alone that saves and transforms us. And we thank you that what Martin Luther talked about in the 1500s was nothing new. Rather, it is all founded on Scripture alone. And we ask, Lord, that as we open your word, not the words of man, but the words of God, that you would help us to see divine truth this morning. Lord, we pray that you would protect us from slipping into the habit of just piling up information in our minds. And instead, Lord, that you would help us to look into our hearts to see the depravity that continues to exist there and yet to be awed by, by the love of Jesus Christ, the one who first loved us, the one who gave his very life so that we could be here this morning and call you our Father and call Jesus our sacrifice. And call the Holy Spirit our helper in this world. Lord, we do pray that as we come to look at a truth that is at some level so familiar to us, that you would knock us over, that you would cause us to be filled with a, a biblical awe at all that Jesus Christ has done for us. Lord, we don't want to necessarily learn new things. Rather, we want to be moved in, in new ways to say thank you. We ask that you would work through your preached word, that you would cause us to, to be more the people that we ought to be, that even the things we think about now would help us to take steps forward in our walk with you. And we thank you that we, we sinful people can pray this, knowing your ear is listening to every request because we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is true that the Reformation really spoke to a need that the world has always felt. Jeremiah said, who can change a leper's spots? Job said, how can a man be right before God? The prophet Isaiah, he bemoans that all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. In the hymn book of the Old Testament, the book of Psalms or Psalms, <laughs> declares in God's sight, no man living is righteous. Scott reminded us last night that since the, the dawn of time, Mankind has been asking certain questions. How can I be reconciled with God? How can a sinner, how can a sinner like me be acceptable to the holy, holy, holy God? At the time of the Reformation, the Western world was divided over how it would answer those two particular questions. In the course of Martin Luther's own life, he, he lived with an immense zeal on both sides of the answer, both sides of the debate. I want to read, it's a longer reading, and uh, Scott made reference to it last night. I want to read to you, in Martin Luther's own words, his eureka moment. His eureka moment. And it, I think it catches so much of the foundations that were laid last night in uh, Scott's address. Let me read this to you. This is Martin Luther's own description of what happened. Meanwhile, in that same year, 1519, 
I had begun interpreting the Psalms once again. I felt confident that I was now more experienced since I had dealt in university courses with St. Paul's letter to the Romans, to the Galatians, and the letter to the Hebrews. I conceived a burning desire to understand what Paul meant in the letter to the Romans. But thus far, there had stood in my way not the cold blood around my heart, but that one word in chapter 1, the justice of God revealed in it. I hate it, that word, justice of God, which by the use and custom of all my teachers, I have been taught to understand philosophically as referring to formal or active justice as they call it, i.e., the justice by which God is just and by which he punishes sinners and the unjust. But I, blameless monk that I was, felt that before God I was a sinner with an extremely troubled conscience. I couldn't be sure that God was appeased with my satisfaction. I did not love. Rather, I hate it. I hate it, the just God who punishes sinners. In silence, if I did not blaspheme, then certainly I grumbled vehemently and got angry at God. I said, isn't it enough that we miserable sinners lost for all eternity because of original sin or oppressed by every kind of calamity through the Ten Commandments? Why does God heap sorrow upon sorrow through the gospel and through the gospel threaten us with his justice and his wrath? This is how I was raging with a wild and disturbed conscience. I constantly, constantly badgered St. Paul about that spot in Romans 1, and I anxiously wanted to know what it meant. And here it is. I meditated night and day on those words until at last, by the mercy of God, I paid attention to their context. The justice of God is revealed in it. As it is written, the just person lives by faith. I began to understand that in this verse, the justice of God is that by which the just person lives, by a gift of God, that is, by faith. I began to understand that this verse means that the justice of God is revealed through the gospel, but it is a passive justice, i.e., that by which merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, the just person shall live by faith. All at once I felt as if I had been born again and entered into paradise through open gates, I immediately saw the whole of Scripture in a different light. I ran through the Scriptures from memory, and I found that other terms had analogous meanings. For example, the work of God. That is, the, the, God, the, the work that God works in us. The power of God, by which He makes us powerful. The wisdom of God, by which He makes us wise. The strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. I exalt it, the sweetest word of mine, the justice of God. With as much love as before I had hated it with hate, the phrase of Paul was for me the very gate of paradise. For Luther, the realization that through faith alone the condemned sinner is declared right before God by God's work. It changed everything for that man. A work of Christ alone with no human merit attached to it. A salvation founded not on faith plus anything, but on faith alone. 
We, we just said this, is no, this was no new discovery. It was, it was a rediscovery of something that Jesus himself had declared 1,500 years before Luther. Open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, and I want you to see in this passage all these wonderful doctrines we're talking about. These are not new. These doctrines were revealed by God's Word from the beginning. Luke chapter 18, and we're going to read a very familiar story to many of you. It begins in verse 9. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 9. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Notice in verse 9, Jesus himself declares this story primarily is for those who trust in themselves for their righteousness. Martin Luther stood up in the 16th century to declare the same thing, the, the, the same principles of this story to his generation who had lost sight of faith alone and were trusting in themselves for their righteousness. In this story, there are two men if two very different views of God, and it causes them to pray so differently. I think in these two men, we, we actually see two periods of Martin Luther's own life. In the Pharisee, we see young Luther, that monk who pressed with his all to qualify for God's favor. While in the tax collector, I think we see old, reformed Luther, who despite realizing very much that he was still plagued by his sin, yet confidently stood on the greatness of Christ's work on the cross. Notice in Jesus' description of these uh, characters that there are two men. This is not rocket science. There are two men here. Look at verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, the listeners, the people that Jesus told this story to, they didn't imagine two men going to the temple for their private devotions, going to the temple to have their quiet time. Rather, automatically, everybody in Jesus' day would have imagined these two men coming to the temple for corporate worship. Corporate worship happened at the temple twice a day, at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m., and that was whenever people went to the temple. And so automatically, that's what people are assuming is the scene that is taking place here. It's not a quiet, private meditation. Rather, it's two men, we could say, coming to church on Sunday morning, the regular time for corporate worship. And yet here, one is a Pharisee and the other is a tax collector. Now, we are over familiar with this story. We automatically jump down the throats of these characters. We stick badges on the chest of the two men. The one is good and one is bad. And we know Jesus, the way Jesus works. We know who the good guy is. We know who the bad guy is. 
But I want you to try and imagine how Jesus' listeners would have heard this story. I want you to step into their shoes. Remember, people who thought they were righteous. And I want you to imagine how they heard what Jesus said. Because when they thought of a Pharisee, they thought of a man who had a high standing in their sight. Pharisees were known for their fastidious religious observance. They, they, they were determined to achieve an exact interpretation of the Old Testament law in order that they could please God better. Even in their day, you, you sometimes find rabbis who wrote about the Pharisees, and they almost make fun of them because these guys just are over and above. They take everything to the nth degree. They want to have such a precise observance of the law. The, the people in front of Jesus who are listening to this story, if they thought anything in their mind about a Pharisee, they would picture somebody who took God's word very seriously. This guy lived well. This guy in their mind would have been the first to give to charity. This guy in their ma mind was the, the committed churchman whose life centered around the religious worship system of his day. And then there's another guy, the tax collector. Now Jesus chooses him very deliberately too. In Jewish thought, to be a tax collector, or to use the, the phrase tax collector, was to remind everybody of the worst of sinners, the most notorious of characters. These men, you know, none of us really like tax collectors. Sorry if you're a tax collector. None of us like them. Thank you. But we respect them. You know, they're, they do a job. But in Jesus' day, it was different. These men were collaborators with the Romans. They, they, these were Jewish people who, to put themselves forward, to line their own pockets with profit, they, they worked with the oppressing enemy force. They, 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 they trembled over the top of their people so that they could bolster themselves. They were considered to be traitors, considered to be thieves, the dregs of society. If you, you, you think of the French politicians in World War II who when the Nazi oppressors came into France, kind of cozied up to them, betrayed their own people who were in the resistance, licked the bootstraps of the Nazis in order that they could secure their own small position and authority. That's the type of character that these men were. Normal people hated them. They would spit on them in the streets. And if they could have gotten away with it, they would have killed them. So funny, whenever you read the Gospels, you, you often come across that phrase, the tax collectors and sinners. They're always clumped in the group, or their, their, their name is always used to describe the, the depravity of a group of people. A good man called John MacArthur, said, the two men were polar opposites. They were the most pious and the most impious, the most respectful and the most despised members of Jewish society. Two very different men. Secondly, I want you to notice the two prayers, the two prayers Look at verse 11 and see the Pharisee's prayer. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. His prayer has two parts to it, two components. And you see one in verse 11 and one in verse 12. In verse 11, God, I thank you 
that I am not like. And then in verse 12, God, I thank you that I do. In verse 11, it says, the Pharisee stands. And here he testifies about himself. Now, in Jewish culture, normally prayers would have been said out loud. That's the way they would have prayed. But notice, these prayers aren't out loud. This isn't a show that the Pharisee is putting on before everybody else. Rather, Jesus has taken us right into the heart of this man, right into his mind, and we get to see his inner thoughts. What is revealed here is not a show that he is putting on before people. Rather, we are getting to see how he actually views himself. It's not the words of public boast. These are the words of internal deception. He really thinks he is meeting the mark. He glances at God, but really he contemplates himself. Notice in his prayer, he asked for nothing. Why? Because he felt his need of nothing. He is so certain of his righteousness that he compares himself favorably to all of these unrighteous lawbreakers. He, as he compares himself to sinners, he notice he's focused on the external. Uh, extortioners, adulterers, ugh, tax collectors. He's no sense of appreciation of sins of the heart. He doesn't weigh up anger, the reality of lust in his heart, the very obvious condition of pride. His view of sin was a cheap view of sin. He saw his sin as simply a stain to be washed off his hands. Rather than, than something that flows out of us from a warped heart, if he was giving himself a grade and he understood the passing grade to be a C, he says, well, I'm probably an A. Especially when I look at you. <laughs> it's a very relative mindset, isn't it? He, he picks the worst of everybody else and he kind of measures himself up against them and thinks, eh, I'm doing okay. I'm not that bad. But it's funny, isn't it? He doesn't compare himself to Moses. The humblest man who ever lived definitely doesn't do that. He doesn't compare himself to Ezra, one who made sure he applied God's word to his own heart before he taught it to others. He doesn't compare himself to Isaiah the prophet, who ultimately was martyred, sawn in two, for his loyalty to God. He doesn't compare himself to Enoch, who walked with God, or certainly doesn't compare himself here to Jesus. In fact, there's no contemplation in his mind of how he stands before holy, holy, holy God. It's all about the worst in the society around him. It's a very deliberate attempt to feel good by looking around and picking the worst people around you and saying, huh, compared to them, I'm doing okay. Self-righteous people love to do that. They avoid measuring themselves against God's law and prefer to measure themselves against the most notorious of sinners. They watch the news and say, well, whew, I would never do that. I would never treat people with that type of callousness. I'm not too bad. Look at verse 12, the second part of his prayer. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. This man certainly has zeal for God, doesn't he? But it's a deluded zeal. The law only obligated fasting once a year on the Day of Atonement. 
The Old Testament law, that's what it said. You fast once a year on the Day of Atonement. But this Pharisee and the, the whole Pharisaical system had got, tried to go over and above. They actually fasted twice a week, normally on Mondays and Thursdays. They went over and above. And, and similarly, when it came to tithes, the, the, the law said you were to tithe. 10% of your income in the Old Testament system. But this man has gone over and above. Everything that he gets, he ties. Because maybe the merchant forgot. Maybe the farmer didn't tithe. And this was an over and above way to make sure that never did an untithed piece of material pass through his hands. He is proudly declaring here to God, regarding your law, I've gone over and above. I've gone above and beyond. It was a mistake that we often make too, of thinking if I could just do more in some parts, it would offset the mess that I've made in others. He piles on his extra pious acts to make up for the sin that he keeps on doing. I'm so full of anger, but I've been married 25 years. I, I lie and work all the time, but, but I go and visit my granny every Saturday. <laughs> Imagine somebody standing before a judge today, and they say to the judge, look, I know I murdered my wife, but before you come up with your verdict, you should know I bought her a really nice car for Christmas. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. It, it, it in no way excuses the wrong that we've done and the corrupt nature of our hearts. But it's far too common a way of thinking. The, the scales that we can make up for our wrong by just piling on the right. That's how this Pharisee fuse, imagines God looking at him, a set of scales, all his bad deeds on one side and all of his good deeds on the other, and he's just got to get it to tip the right way. He's got to have more for him than against him. And compared to these other people, he's probably, he's probably there. Certainly they don't deserve to be here where nobody's perfect but I've got more right to be here than they do. How often as evangelicals do we make that same mistake? Where in our mind, at least, we don't say it openly because we believe in faith alone, but in our minds, we begin to list our habits of praying every morning, never missing a service at church, the consistency of our quiet times. And we imagine them as being a badge of honor. They make God smile at us a little bit brighter than the person beside us. It gives us favor. Why does God listen to me? Well, because I'm committed to him. Why will God help me out today? Well, because I started my day by spending time with him. Because I did, I deserve brownie points. Because I prayed, God has to be nice to me. Our thoughts in our own prayers too often are like this man. It's, it's true, when we get to the end of our prayer, we always pray in Jesus' name. But really, the confidence in our prayer too often is in what we have done before we prayed who we are. Too often we are Pharisees. This man prays sincerely. He really does. But he's sincerely deluded. He sees himself, and maybe he was, head and shoulders morally above the rest of his peers. But he's nowhere close to reaching up and touching the Everest tip of God's perfect righteousness. He genuinely thought his efforts made him righteous. But did they? 
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 2, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It was not enough. Luther said, this presumption of righteousness is a huge and horrible monster to break and crush it. God needs a large and powerful hammer, and that is the law, which is the hammer of death, the thunder of hell, and the lightning of divine wrath. And to what purpose? To attack the presumption of righteousness, which is a rebellious, stubborn, and stiff-necked beast Your self-righteousness needs to be smashed apart by God if faith alone can ever exist. That wasn't something that Luther stumbled across as he studied. It was something he actually lived. It was his colleague and friend Melanchthon who wrote the first biography of Luther. And when Luther left his career in law and came into the the life in the, the monastic order, when he entered the monastery, this is what Melanchthon says. On his entrance there, he not only applied with the closest diligence to ecclesiastical studies, but also with the greatest severity of discipline. He exercised the government of himself and far surpassed all others in the comprehensive range of reading and disputation with a zealous observance of fasting and prayer. Who does that sound like? Who does young Luther remind you of? See, young Luther, he also viewed life as a a set of balances, a set of scales. You just got to get it to tip the right way. Live a little better than everybody else. But what changed for Luther was a very close friend died. Someone he knew and cared about, and it shocked his system. All of a sudden, when he heard about this friend, he was struck with that truth that he could die. And in a moment, he would stand before the judgment throne of God. And as he thought about that, that throne. He couldn't get away from the question, have I done enough? When you're dead, who cares about the extortioner, the adulterer, or this tax collector? Because when you die, now you stand before holy God, and you are judged by yourself. It was that thought that caused Luther to panic. Again, he's, he's still thinking of life as a set of skills, but now he realizes that sin is more ugly than he, he thought. And, and so he's thinking about how do I make sure I'm okay before this throne? And, and his mind goes crazy. He, he, he thinks of every sin as something that needs to be confessed. And penance done to clean it up, to wash off that stain. He needs to be able to stand before that throne with no stains on him to make sure the scales tip in his favor. But but how could he remember every sin? Luther began to realize that, that, that every thought of his heart was evil from birth. And as his mind raced, trying to remember every single point where he stumbled, every single mistake that he made, and every time he would run to his superior and confess, it became, it became an exhausting activity. Not only that, it exhausted his superior. <laughs> this is what the superior said. Look here, Brother Martin. If you are going to confess so much... Why don't you go and do something worth confessing? (laughs) Kill your mother or father. Commit adultery. Stop coming in here with such flummery and fake sins. 
And to get some peace, he came up with another idea. He sent Luther away to go and study theology. Let's lock him in the library and it'll save us all. The thought was that he would be so busy that, quote, he won't have time for his intractable self-examination. See, what was happening to Luther was he was actually looking into his heart. And the deeper he looked, the more and more disturbed he got. Because the more and more he realized how deep his sin problem actually went. At this moment, he is despairing. He can't sleep. He's an anxious man. But he was about to discover true freedom. But before he could discover that true freedom, he was going to have to become a different character, a different man, more like the second man in this story of Jesus. Look at the tax collector's prayer in verse 13. Look how it's described. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Notice how he approaches God here. Do you know, the, the Pharisee, his approach to God in prayer, there's only five words used to describe it. For him, it's a very easy thing to come before God. It's an obvious thing for a good man like him to do, to, to talk to God. Why would God not want to listen to him? But in contrast to those five words, there are 19 words used to describe the tax collector's approach. It says, he stood far off. Idea is in the temple, all the regular worshipers are pushing to the front. They want to be near the altar. They want to be where all the activity is. They want to be close to the, the presence of God. But this man doesn't. He stands far off. He knows the truth of Psalm 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false, who does not swear deceitfully. This man, this tax collector knew that people are at odds with a holy God. It's not just that he thinks of other people around him as being more deserving. Ah, oh, they're probably better than me and they should get close to the front. Rather, if it was just him and God in the temple at that moment, he would still be standing far off because he's too full of fear. He's too nervous to stand any closer to holy, holy, holy God. Look at verse 13 as well. It says, he would not even lift his eyes to heaven. To lift your eyes up to heaven, to look up. That was a, a normal Jewish posture for prayer. You think of how we pray. We, we bow our heads and close our eyes. You know, we, we tell our kids at the dinner table, okay, bow your heads, close your eyes, we're going to pray. Well, in Jewish culture, they would say, lift your eyes up, look to heaven, we're going to pray. But this man can't do it. He can't do what's normal because of his shame. He can't look up in the direction of God. Instead, what does he do? Verse 13. He beats his breast. Again, that's not normal. You don't find that in very many points in the Bible. There's, there's maybe two other points where we read about somebody beating their breast. One of them's used to describe David. When David's son Absalom dies, and David is struck with the, the reality that Absalom has entered eternal damnation. As a father, he's crushed. He's full of the most intense grief. And it says he continuously beat his chest. That's the picture here. This man feels the heaviness of his condition. 
He feels the seriousness of his brokenness. All he can do is thump his chest. He forgets all normal standards of the world around him. They were, everybody else in the temple is probably looking at him thinking, what is going on there? But for him, again, there may as well only be two people in the room. Holy God and his sinful self. At this moment, he rightly feels the weight of being a sinner standing before the sin crusher. Look at the prayer itself. Again, think of the words that are used. In the Pharisees' prayer, there are 29 words used, but only six in the tax collector's prayer. It's very short. In the Pharisees' prayer, he he keeps referring to himself. He mentions himself five times. And it's always with the active voice. I do this. I do that. But the tax collector, notice God is the subject of his prayer. It's passive. It's God doing the action to him. God, please do this for me. Do this to me. Look at it in verse 13. God, be merciful to me. What does it say? A sinner. Did you notice how he describes himself? He defines himself by his sin. Now, most of our versions say a sinner, but the definite article is there. Really, he's not just saying, I'm a sinner like everybody else. Rather, he sees himself as the sinner. He defines himself by his sin. That's who I really am. I'm not funny. I'm not smart. I'm not hardworking. If you want a descriptive word for me, I'm the sinner. That's who I am. See, for young Luther, sin was a problem. But even though he obsessed with it, it wasn't a very deep problem. If he could just remember it, he could go and he could give himself a wee penance scrub and get that stain removed. So he just had to remember, and that's what he got so anxious about. But he didn't think deeply enough about the problem. What changed in his thinking was he started to realize that sin wasn't just a stain. Oops, I made a mistake. Let's wash that off. Rather, sin is the flow out of the heart. That the problem wasn't, oh, one more mistake. The problem was in here where the mistakes flowed out from. It wasn't on the surface It was the inside that was a mess. It was his internal being and drive that needed to be fixed. These sins weren't just additional blemishes that needed to be removed. Rather, what Luther came to realize was the very core of his being was at fault. And from it came all these sinful actions. See, most Pharisees if they, when they're being honest, they know they're not perfect. Very few people think they're actually perfect. They, 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 they know they still depend on God to give them a leg up into heaven. But they think he'll do it because they've earned his favor. But the sinner, he understands he has nothing to offer. He's helpless. All he is, is the sinner. Only God can contribute anything of value here. So rotten trees can't produce fruit. I've met a few people who work with fruit already this uh, last night. Rotten trees don't produce fruit. Now, as a person who knows absolutely nothing about gardening, bear with me in this illustration. Imagine if I was trying to put on a good appearance, and so I took all my plastic fruit took it to my dead rotted tree, 
and I duct taped the plastic fruit to it. <laughs> Try to make it look like there was some life about it. There was something real going on. Well, it would all be fake, wouldn't it? Just because I duct tape plastic fruit to the tree doesn't mean that there's any real life in the tree. Doesn't mean that anything is actually changing. The problem is the core of the tree. And similarly, no man or woman can truly bear Christ-like fruit, real love, real joy, real peace, real patience, until the internal disease at the very core of their being is dealt with. Until that disease is killed, every good thing you try to do is simply duct taping plastic fruit to yourself. It just doesn't work. It doesn't change anything. You're a dead tree. Rather, a true understanding of your need for faith alone can only be grasped when you start to understand the bondage that you are in to sin. You, you, you need to understand just how ugly your inside actually is. How it pollutes every aspect of your being. It caused Luther to say, if anyone would feel the greatness of sin, he would not be able to go on living. So great is its power. Have you ever had a taste of that? That weight that your sin has? Have you ever felt crushed below it? Have you ever come to the point of this man in the text and acknowledged that your sin actually defines you? Have you ever been able to say, do you know what? I am the sinner. A person can only truly be saved when they've come to this point where they, they realize that they are a mess. They don't just need a clean up. What they need is a changed heart. Yet notice what the tax collector does in his measly six words. Despite knowing that he can do nothing, look at verse 13. God be merciful to me, the sinner. He still makes a request. He's a sinner, remember. He knows Hebrews 10, 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. He feels that at that moment. And yet, there's something very ironic here. He knows it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And yet, what does he do? He throws himself into the hands of that same angry God. Luther said, it is necessary if you would be converted that you become terrified. That is, you have an alarmed and trembling conscience. Then after this condition has been created, you must grasp the consolation. It comes not from any work of your own, but from the work of God. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world in order to proclaim to terrified sinners the mercy of God. The remedy, you see, isn't found in just having a low view of yourself. Maybe you've come here this morning and you feel worthless. You, you feel, I've got a sin problem and I can't get away from it. That's a good start, but it's not enough. Judas hung himself with that same feeling. Rather, what is needed is a true view of self that causes us to collapse upon the full person and work of Jesus Christ. You need a, to understand your sin in its darkest shade because that pushes you to the work of Jesus. And that's exactly what happens to this tax collector. He doesn't simply ask for mercy. Rather, the word that's used there and translated as mercy, there's, it's more specific than just that. Really, an older English word, propitious, is better. And we don't use it today, so mercy will be good. But, but let me help you understand what the depth of meaning is here. You remember in the Old Testament, they had the Ark of the Covenant. And it sat in the center of the temple. 
and it was surrounded by this curtain that cut it off from everybody else. But people came to the temple primarily to be near the Ark of the Covenant. And on the top of that Ark sat, and here's our word, the mercy seat. The mercy seat. And God's presence was said to dwell over the mercy seat in a profound and special way. And what the high priest had to do once a year in the Day of Atonement was to come in through that curtain and to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat to atone for the sin of the people. That's the idea here. The mercy seat is in mind. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. God, atone in your mercy for me, the sinner. He feels the depth of his sin, that he hasn't simply done a few wrong things, but at the very core of his being, he is corrupt. He's having a Psalm 51 moment. Lord, there is no sacrifice I could bring or I would bring it. I have nothing to offer. My sin is ever before me. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Oh, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. It's such a wild request, isn't it? A wild request for an undeserving man to make. Though this tax collector's prayer is described by Jesus as a picture of humbleness, if you brought that type of request to anybody else in our world, they would look at you like you had two heads. Imagine coming to the judge, I know I've done wrong, but show mercy. We we, We'd look at them like they were ridiculous. No human principality or power would show anything but contempt at such a bold request. It's ridiculous from a human perspective. But that's exactly the point. Faith alone is in action here. You are truly forgiven this morning when you've been brought to this point where you realize you deserve only divine wrath, but cry out and instead are shown mercy. And so cry, hallelujah. What a savior. Unlike this Pharisee, the tax collector, he's unaware of everyone else in the room All he can think about is his own significant feeling. For that, he cries out to God for mercy. Two men, two prayers, and lastly, notice there's two different outcomes. Remember the crowd listening to the story? They've been nodding their heads through the Pharisee's prayer. Oh, yes, good man, good man. I know know people like that. Yes, yes, good character. And then during the tax collector's prayer, they scowl. They look their worst. They've been sucking lemons. And they're tutting. Oh, what an arrogant guy. How dare he think God should listen to him after he's lived such a wasteful life? And then Christ declares in verse 14. What does he say? I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The unthinkable has happened here. God heard and God answered the sinner's prayer. While a pious Pharisee, he may as well have prayed to the wall. There was no response there. There was nothing heard there. Specifically, Jesus declared that special word that that Scott unpacked for us last night. This tax collector is justified. In other words, now he has a right standing before God. Now he can come into the very presence of God. The verdict in this tax collector is astounding. 
But the tense of the word, it makes it even more remarkable because the word is passive. It's passive. In other words, this man hasn't done anything to himself to be justified. Rather, the, the, the input has come outside of himself. God has justified him. It's come from outside. God has done it all. The, the energy, the action, the, the will that made this happen. It's not found in the tax collector. It's found in God. The tense also, it's perfect. It's declaring here that this verdict is not just a verdict for today. Today, tax sector, good news, you're justified, but be on your guard tomorrow. No, no. Rather, this is a permanent new state of being. In other words, tax collector, today, tomorrow, the day after, through all of eternity, you will remain justified. What a wonderful thing. By faith alone, your justification is a permanent verdict. It cannot be weakened. It cannot be taken away. It cannot even be made any less. If you're a doubting Christian this morning, this is a beautiful doctrine. Reeves and Chester, in their little book, Why the Reformation Still Matters, which is a great book, they say this. This is a deeply personal doctrine. Every time I sin, I create a reason to doubt my acceptance by God, and I question my future with God. But day after day, the doctrine of justification speaks peace to my soul. Jesus sums it up this way. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. We could stretch that out to say, you who today spend your time exalting yourself and your efforts, in the future you're going to be humbled by God. But the one who today humbles himself and understands who they really are will be lifted up by God himself. There's grace alone in action. One commentator has said the Pharisee stands before God in self-congratulation while a tax collector stands before God in prayer. Though two went up to the temple to pray, only one really prayed. God doesn't work within us on our terms. He won't allow any you in your salvation story. This all is a work of God. Now, that's not hard intellectually to accept. But thousands of years of work-based religion declares that we as human beings find this incredibly hard to actually embrace. J.C. Ryle said, there is nothing really mysterious to understand about saving belief. But the whole difficulty arises from man's pride and self-righteousness. It is the very simplicity of justifying faith at which thousands stumble. They cannot understand it because they will not stoop. Are you refusing to stoop this morning to get on your hands and knees and crawl? Are you refusing to accept there is actually no good in you? There's no you in this good news. You can't know and learn your way into the kingdom. Indeed, you can't feel your way into the kingdom. Ryle continues, True faith in Christ is the unreserved trust of a heart convinced of sin in Christ as an all-sufficient Savior. 
In other words, what saves you is an overwhelming faith that says Jesus has indeed paid it all. The full price for my sin was transferred to him, and that ransom was completely paid. It was all dealt with by Christ. There's no leftovers. There's there's no little dusting for me to do. It's fully, it's completely, comprehensively done. Faith alone is knowing one's sin, but being enraptured with the astounding work of Jesus, and so simply looks to him for mercy. Faith alone wasn't just a bee in Luther's bonnet. It's a key to eternal life. The church of his day had taken that key and tucked it under the rug. They'd hidden it from that generation. Old Luther could say, if faith is not without all, even the smallest work, it doesn't justify. Indeed, it is not even faith. In other words, Luther was saying, there can be no you in your story. If this morning you are standing here, and if someone asks you, why are you a Christian? You say, well, I go to this church. I'm very committed to reading the scriptures. I come to conferences like this because I want to to learn and grow. If any of that becomes your answer, you do not know faith alone. Who are you like this morning? Are you young Luther or old Luther? Are you the Pharisee? Or are you the tax collector? Look at me a moment. Could it be that you've fallen into the same trap as this Pharisee? Maybe a little bit different. You think you've got the point of the sermon. And at the moment in your mind, you're praying and saying, God, I thank you that I am not like those Pharisees. (laughs) (laughs) Pharisees thought of themselves as steadfast. Could it be that you have fallen into their trap of promoting yourself because you're not like the watered-down Christian culture around you. And on that, you stand. You, You come and you sing passionately. You love being at church. You covet truth. Yet the young man's habit has sprung up in you. If you're falling into that trap of having confidence in something you bring to the table... Luther says, lay aside all confidence in works and grow in the knowledge not of works, but of Christ. Christ Jesus who suffered and rose for you. Our gospel is a message that he has done everything. He has done it all. That's not a small thing. But when Jesus hung on the cross and cried out, it is finished. It was finished. That's what true Christianity stands on. That's why we worship. That's why we sing. We realize that all we can do is collapse on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Faith sees, Luther said, because it takes hold of Christ and believes that my sin and death are damned and abolished in the sin and death of Christ. In other words, faith knows we have been united to Christ. His perfect life is my perfect life. His death is my death. His resurrection will be my resurrection. Luther said, his righteousness is yours and your sin is his. This morning, do you have faith? Faith to declare, 
Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt this heart of stone. Why do we have confidence before God? Why at the beginning did we pray and contemplate ourselves talking to the alive and active king of the universe? What is your faith in? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, sometimes we don't know what to say as we come into your presence because we've been reminded afresh of just what ugly creatures we actually are, how undeserving we are of any goodness that you have shown to us. And yet we thank you that we can come as the sinner and ask you afresh for mercy, knowing that we are and continue to be justified by the fact that Jesus paid it all. Lord, we pray that you would give us the ability this morning to trust and move our hearts to have an th even deeper thankfulness for the full work of Jesus Christ than we have experienced to this point. We pray that he would be glorified amongst us because he has paid it all. And in his name, in his confidence, in his work, we pray, amen.